So today, last class we went over how the magnetization responds to simple um, experiments uh, for, to a series of RF pulses. What kind of signal you would get under different conditions like um, homogeneous field versus non-homogeneous field. Um, and how would you write the equations of the magnetization uh, under the uh, influence of different RF pulses. In this class, what we are going to go over is going one step further certainly to look at what how do we encode uh, space so last class we just looked at what kind of signal you would get from the whole sample we haven't done any spatial encoding so in this color in this lecture we will try to understand how spatial encoding is being done so i had actually included some basic uh, recap uh, slides but most likely you guys seem to be up to date with that so i'm not going to go over it um, so the key points uh, anyway for the last class were just uh, that if you repeat the experiment, if you have a repeat pulse experiment, then your signal becomes uh, uh, dependent on both the longitudinal transverse relaxation times. And then you saw this uh, spin echo, um, how you can actually refocus those spins which are uh, defacing due to the magnetic field in homogeneity using just an RF pulse and you looked at how you actually can mathematically understand what uh, is happening to the phase of the spins. You went through this. The key point being the instantaneous reversal of the phase when you apply the pi pulse. Assuming that the pi pulse is, um, uh, is exactly 180 degrees meaning uh, leading to exact 180 degree tipping. Now that leads to what's called the echo uh, when the phase becomes zero. Uh, um, for the spins, hence the echo time. So, uh, so the TDK or the recovery of the signal is given by that equation, and you also saw the inversion recovery, which was essentially similar multiple sequence per traversed pi pulse versus. So earlier you saw pi by two, and then pi pulse for the spin echo. In this case, you have pi preceding the pi, uh, the 90 degree pulse, and you looked at how to derive the uh, magnetization equations uh, for by breaking up the pulse structure or the sequence of the timing into different time windows and then writing the behavior of the magnetization uh, in each window. So coming to our class today, so we will be these are the key points that we'll be essentially covering introducing some new terminology uh, like frequency encoding and NK space etc. And we'll be understanding one of the key uh, approaches to imaging which is the gradient echo um, and that's essentially what is uh, behind most of the imaging that we do. So let's start with this um, long expression that we actually started looking at in chapter 7 where uh, basically the signal being proportional to a bunch of parameters including the uh, the coil uh, the coil reception field the magnetization and then the uh, term the phase term which includes both the phase of the coil as well as the tipping phase of the magnetization as well as the um, influence of demodulation now if we ignore the relaxation effects that's the e power minus t by t2 term there and hence also its spatial dependence uh, and we assume that the coil uh, uh, characteristics are uniform which means that um, your reception field is perfectly flat throughout the sample which may, which also in turn in terms of the parameters in the equation the beta parameter becomes a constant it doesn't become a conch functional space uh, and then the phi naught and the theta underscore p this, this term at the end also it can be considered as a constant so you can absorb that and then write uh, an equation something like this where the proportionality becomes equal to sine where um, and this uh, capital lambda this uh, including these additional phase terms the constant phase terms as well as the uh, electronic gain terms etc so once you write this uh, you can see that the signal is basically the volume integration of the 
spins within the sample. And if you go back and look at um, uh, what the number of spins available that are giving you the signal, um, way back till chapter, I think, 5 or 6, is where you see this equation of the, uh, which is dependent on the, the polarization, meaning the number of spins available for you to give the signal at a particular field strength is dependent on the magnetic field, it's inversely proportional to temperature. Um, so that expression is uh, evident here. And then once you substitute that into um, this equation where m perpendicular, you re represent that in terms of an, what's called an effective spin density, rho r. The same integral that we looked at in the previous slide, you can write that by absorbing all those terms into the rho r term. Now that is your effective spin density, which is in turn given by this uh, long expression, which actually is quite uh, illustrative in terms of understanding the dependencies of the signal that you have on different experimental parameters. So beta, we assume this uniform, so you don't have that um, spatial dependency, but you can see that it's certainly dependent on B naught, inversely proportional to T, and of course, certainly uh, dependent on omega naught as well. So that is the effective spin density that you are obtaining when you do um, when you obtain a signal from the sample. We'll come to how we are actually reconstructing the uh, sample um, signal by spatially um, through spatial encoding uh, in a few minutes. So uh, the key point here also to note is that we have ignored the relaxation effects that we started with in the previous equation where um, e power minus t by t2 term was um, prefixed in that integral equation. So if in reality, well in reality, in, the, in general, you cannot ignore those relaxation terms and essentially your um, effective spin density ends up being to some extent weighted by these relaxation mechanisms. So you want to be careful when you want to quantify, let's say, spin density of a sample, then um, you want to look at the uh, experimental parameters that uh, you're using to do this quantification and how that depends on the relaxation terms. So signal through this one is only uh, weighted by spin density, right? Right. In this case, we have not introduced any other factor that if you, we haven't even done any spatial encoding. We're just saying that this signal that you're getting from the sample is dependent on all these parameters. And don't forget, the point is that don't forget the relaxation terms as well, which if you consider, then your weighting will certainly be there in that particular expression for pro R. Is, do you want these lights down? Is it okay? Okay. So, um, now let's move on and uh, look at the phase term. You had actually come across this in the last class where we were talking about the T2 prime. Um, the T2 prime being equivalent to the integral of this particular phase term. Uh, and that came about because we considered the uh, magnetic field inhomogeneities that were within the sample. So if we just uh, take a closer look at this particular phase term. Essentially, um, just, just if you want to keep track of things, how we, how we, how things evolved, you had that long integral equation, you summarized that and lumped all the terms into the row R term. So now things become a little bit easier to understand what is going to happen to your signal when you do a certain kind of experiment. So before we actually move on to um, different experimental conditions, we want to just look at what these expressions mean and how they can be mathematically um, kind of clarified. So this uh, term, capital omega minus omega RT, the small omega being the function of both space and time. So for the meantime, just let's ignore just for a brief moment the time dependency and just look at its spatial dependency, which means that there is some precession, distribution of precession frequencies in your sample. Uh, 
Now, once you um, expand that omega r, which is essentially so uh, the Lama frequency plus the deviation relative to the Lama frequency, and if you substitute that, that's your demodulated phase. Meaning that once you demodulate the signal, meaning removing the capital omega not uh, capital omega contribution, just looking at the signal in the rotating reference frame, you would have this kind of phase evolution of your signal, which is basically proportional to the deviation um, of your precession frequency relative to omega naught. So, um, so ideally we write phase is equal to omega t. That's assuming that your omega is not a function of time. Now, I, in some cases, as you would see in, in general, actually in an imaging experiment, your omega, you're going to modulate or basically you're going to control that omega and for your imaging purposes. So uh, that means that the precession frequency now, because you're controlling it, so switching on and off, etc., that becomes a function of time. So you want to write the phase term as an integral rather than um, just product of omega times t, which is assuming that omega is constant. So that's why this is the more generic expression of uh, a phase that you would be using uh, as we move along. And it becomes easier to think in these terms in terms of an integral of that phase, as you will see in the advanced chapters uh, when you move on to 17 and then uh, 19 uh, further within the textbook. So, or just put simply, it's just e power i phi. So, phi being the all important parameter here because that's, that integral is essentially um, controlled or influenced by two things. One is the spatial variation of rho r, the other is the spatially dependent phase of your um, spins. So, to, I mean, that was when you looked at this particular slide, we essentially we have not in, to, done any encoding and um, under the ideal situation where there was no delta omega, then it's just the integral of your spin densities and that's your signal. Of course, you would have the power t minus t by t2 in front of it, so you would have that decay of the signal when you have the FID, which I think one of you guys answered just the case where you just have a sample, you apply the 90 degrees, assuming that the field is perfectly homogeneous, you just have a single decay of T2. But if you have a finite uh, V0 uh, changes within your sample, that's the expression or the integral equation that you would have. So this is not nothing to do with encoding of space yet. yet. So let's now uh, look at how space um, spatial information is encoded. So in that encoding aspect, basically you want to distinguish signal coming from one, sam one side of the sample or one part of the sample from another part of the sample. In 1970s, um, Dr. Lauterbur and Dr. Mansfield, they have realized that uh, an easy, a simple way to be able to do that is by purposefully changing V0. In the previous slide, you had the delta omega, which was a nuisance for us because it was causing faster decay, it was causing the T2 star aspect. So the brilliance here was that they actually wanted to purposefully change the magnetic field to be able to do a more organized job of distinguishing in a, uh, in a clear manner what spins or what signal is coming from which part of the sample by purposefully varying the V0. So the simplest way was um, and remains to be in today, although there are other ways of actually encoding that are coming up, but they are not in vogue certainly. All, almost all the clinical imaging is essentially based on this particular simple concept where the, of spatial encoding where your uh, precession frequency becomes a function of space or coordinate of your spins by introducing the magnetic field gradient. So you, you have control of that magnetic field gradient, you are purposefully switching on that gradient and making the precession frequency a function of space. 
which means that every at every position z the precession frequency is different well just a graphical example i mean, I mean representation here so if you have a gradient a linearly varying gradient now remember that the gradient is only modifying the bz it's not particularly applying a new new field along any direction it's just modifying the existing bz which is the b naught that we have been talking about and making it a function of z coordinate or it can be any coordinate in this case we are just assuming that this being along the z direction so since we are looking at 1d case one dimensional case understanding the signal behavior what happens in one dimensional case and then we will move on to multi dimensional aspects so you have a linearly varying uh, bz field and that's causing a uh, change in precession frequency as a function of the z coordinate now once you um, have that particular gradient on at t equal to 0 which means the the point where you just tip the magnetization all the spins are in sync so there is no um, addition uh, additional phase accumulation meaning basically they are all in sync uh, and let's assume for the moment that there is no background field in homogeneity. So, meaning the field is perfectly flat, and if, and if the gradient was not on, then the signal would just decay as T2. Now, once you switch on the gradient, the, there will be uh, a difference in the precession frequency as a function of space, and uh, on one side of the, of the center of the magnet, so you will have this kind of phase accrual, on the other side, you will have this kind of phase accrual. And what you are getting, um, this as a function of time, this accrual increases, meaning basically the phase accrues. And this is the spatial, sorry, as a function of time, and that's your spatial um, axis. And what you are getting, the signal, is the sum of all those spins, meaning the vector sum of all those spins. And that is what this particular equation represents. So it's essentially the vector summation of all those spins precessing slightly at different precession rates, which you have um, imparted to it for your spatial encoding. So uh, this is the generic term. And uh, let's uh, see for our case of one dimensional imaging what the equations turn out to be. So again, we're just going through the cycle just so um, it's fresh in our mind, uh, the kind of the steps of that equation. So, for 1D case, uh, basically the um, rho r and d cube r just become, uh, instead of a volume integral, they become uh, basically uh, a linear integral, meaning one dimension integral. So, the, the steps, step uh, you've seen here is basically the same that you saw in the couple of slides before essentially demodulating where uh, now the function is explicitly given as a linearly dependent function on uh, z where g is basically d omega by dz or dv by dz either way actually g is dv by dz and when you multiply with comma and then z coordinate that becomes the precession frequency so once you demodulate this becomes your um, expression for phase and since g is constant for between 0 and time t, you have gamma g z t as your uh, phase term and your signal in turn becomes that equation. So essentially this is your 1D imaging equation. For a one dimensional encoding of space, this is what is going to, this is what is the signal that you would be getting from your coil. Now how to get uh, back the spin density that you're interested in mapping. So um, to actually uh, be able to do that, uh, in fact, you can do. Um, you can realize just by looking at this in general uh, that this is the Fourier relation between the uh, signals that are sampled in time versus um, uh, the encoded signal um, in space. But it becomes easier because it's now you have time on one side and then space on the other. It becomes tough to kind of um, 
uh, think of it in, in terms of a Fourier pair. So it's easier actually to um, clearly uh, do a basically simple uh, variable change uh, by expressing the phase as, as this particular parameter where k is given by gamma gt. Uh, note that this is gamma bar. Actually, I couldn't find the symbol in LaTeX for the gamma crossbar. So I just, uh, this is what you use in your textbook, but this is what I had used in my, uh, uh, in, in these slides. So gamma bar is nothing but gamma by 2 pi. So k is given by gamma gt. That is for a, for a constant gradient in this case. Um, and then you can write that the same above expression through the variable substitution uh, in this manner. Now, k and c are Fourier pair variables where k is your spatial frequency uh, domain variable and z is your spatial um, uh, variable. And this actually uh, is more easy to realize that this is the Fourier relationship between the um, sampled signal in the k domain and the uh, spatial domain uh, information. So that's your one dimensional in, um, imaging uh, equation in terms of k. Why we are interested in changing the variables anyways? So um, when you sample the signal, you are still sampling the signal in the time domain. But how are you relating that particular time variable to your spatial information that you are encoding? <laughs> To make that more obvious, you are changing that variable and making just uh, the, so you have gamma g and z. So certainly your encoding is dependent on your gradient. By summarizing those, um, the terms uh, of uh, gradient and the time, basically, um, okay, what's the better way of answering this question? I'm just trying to think. Um, In terms of units, I can say, I can give you a simple answer. Uh, maybe a more detailed answer is there. I will try to find it out. But in terms of simple uh, units, one by k has the units of z, or one by z has the units of k. So, in if you think of analogous terms in Fourier uh, theory, so one by t is your frequency domain. T is your time domain. So you have time and frequency domain which are the Fourier pair variables. Similarly, you have uh, k and z in this case. Without that variable substitution, that particular relationship is not quite apparent. Even though you can continue to carry out these integrations and derive the uh, what the signal is going to be in terms of these pure variables, meaning pure meaning variables that you can clearly apparently see in your, in your experiment, gamma, Gamma is a constant, of course. Uh, G and time are something that you can uh, palpably see in your um, imaging equation or imaging uh, sequence that you're going to implement. Whereas K is, you can say it's probably imaginary. It's not easy to relate right away. However, in terms of your experimental parameters, however, it becomes easier actually when you uh, consider the sampling conditions or sampling uh, criteria uh, for imaging uh, or for reconstructing your spin densities, the relationships between k and z are more, um, how to put it, uh, follow the Fourier pair relationships basically. So that would be the simple answer for me, for you to, is that, does that make sense to you in, in general? No. Okay, so if you want, you can do this uh, exercise or when we come to the chapter 10, um, let's see what, uh, in terms of the original variables, what the conditions for sampling your signal would turn out to be versus uh, in terms of K, how easy is it to understand, to understand these sampling conditions between K versus the original variables of gamma GT. Okay, so we'll see at that point, you will see at the point that uh, the relationships for drawing out for sampling and um, 
um, for example, in your okay, actually, there's no point in going over this at this point. We'll when we actually come to chapter 10 and further, uh, more so in chapter 15 as well. Uh, the relationship between K and your experimental parameters, uh, the tangible experimental parameters, for example, your field of view, your voxel size, they all become quite uh, easy to understand uh, with the variable substitution K versus looking at the original uh, variables of gamma GT. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so you had, uh, we've seen that uh, integral equation and uh, essentially just to give you a visual uh, aid that integral equation is basically summing up all these excuse me all these vectors the phase of all these vectors that's what that integral means this is the summation and that's what you're sampling as function of time okay. uh, why the duration of rotation is uh, <coughs> different in two sides of the axis right? so this um, Let's forget about that minus sign for a minute. Okay. You have minus gamma g here. So if you just forget about that for a minute, the spins experiencing at this location, uh, the, the, the field experienced by the spins at this location is higher compared to the field experienced by the spins on the other end, right? So relative to the center frequency omega naught, this would appear rotating faster, right. and that would appear rotating slower. But not it it will appear to be opposite direction because it's a crewing phase on the other side because it's lagging behind so you are running let's say three people are running okay then one person is in the center the other person is ahead moving faster the other the third the um, the, the third person being lagging behind so of course from the perspective of the third person everybody is in the front so everybody is accruing more positive phase but relative to the center person, this person has a negative phase. The person who is running faster has a positive phase. That's it. It's essentially what you're seeing here. Just translate that linear motion into circular motion. That's all. Is that clear? So it's important to remember that there is no one-on-one -on -one relation in terms of spatial coordinates or so the sample or the signal that you acquire at a particular time t is not related to, to, to a particular location, a spatial location in your sample. It is coming, that particular signal is coming from all over the sample. It's the integral of that signal, um, of the signal from throughout the sample. Okay, so your 1D imaging equation. Um, this uh, is your... Uh, in the, written in terms of k and this is uh, if you want to get back the uh, spin density uh, this is the equation that you would write because uh, by realizing that this is the um, Fourier transform of your spin density that's what you're sampling and the inverse Fourier transformation of your spin density is what you're going to uh, do or perform to obtain your spin density as a function of space. Now if you notice the k and the z, of course z being, um, you can choose your coordinate origin anywhere, but the key point is that that integration is happening throughout the sample, meaning it's the integration of the whole sample. And in, in terms of uh, the inverse Fourier transform, the values of k go from minus infinity to plus infinity. That is in the uh, analytic case. Of course, uh, you can't sample uh, the signal forever, meaning t cannot go to infinity or k cannot go to infinity. That means you have, you will end up with a finite well number of a finite well amount of values or band of values of k, which is limited because, of course, you have your t2 decay, so the signal is going to go to zero, right? So because of that, your k, the values over which you're the um, uh, you're going to obtain your signal is going to be limited. So uh, let's look at this in terms of the timing curve uh, diagram or the sequence diagram. So you have the RF pulse and then uh, uh, you have switched on uh, the gradient that we were talking about. And you will see something like uh, this in terms of your uh, signal that you, would see, that you would get. It looks like the FID and you can 
more or less call that an FID because it is basically decay of the signal under the influence of the gradient. That gradient can be a background field in homogeneity which you didn't purposefully switch on, it's there in the sample. But in this case, because you have switched on a gradient for your spatial encoding purpose, you have a similar decay of uh, signal which is basically um, um, similar to the T2 star decay. Whereas in this case, it would be faster than T2 star because you actually uh, speeded up that dephasing process by switching on your gradient. So you have the background field in homogeneity present. If you have in that sample to begin with, if you have a background field in homogeneity, you will have the normal FID even if you didn't have the gradient on. Now with the gradient on, you are going to speed up the decay process. So you will have, you will see this kind of beat frequency uh, um, feature. But how we, uh, how we get the echo here? No, we haven't talked about the echo yet. But we have the code. No, that's not, that's just an FID. There's no echo there. So what do you call, I mean, those? That's just a, a free induction decay, but in this case, it's a free induction decay in the presence of gradient. Echo, for the condition for echo is essentially phase should be equal to zero, right? The phase of the of your spins should be equal to zero. Uh, and you're sampling around the, I mean, okay, we'll come to that, but the condition for an echo is, is uh, the signal phase being equal to zero that is being met here. In fact, in reality, that is being met at the center of the RF pulse, at which point you are not sampling the signal yet. So you are losing the center of k-space. I mean, forget, I mean, we haven't introduced k-space yet, but uh, you are losing the center point, meaning the echo point, right? So that's why it's, this is still not an echo, this is still the FID in the presence of a gradient. We will come to the echo part uh, quite soon. Uh, let's just uh, look at the influence of a gradient to understand that in a very simple system of two spins. Now this is basically uh, similar to what the cartoon that you had seen last time where you had uh, two spins which are processing at two different frequencies. Um, let's assume that this is, they are processing at two frequencies because of the presence of a gradient. Okay? There is something more tangible if you see that playing out as a function of time. The same thing is actually given, uh, uh, shown here in the bottom, in the C, just above the C part, I mean in the C part. So um, when you have two spins, let's say at um, processing at two different frequencies. Now let's get into the details. Um, these spins, uh, let's say, are at equidistant positions relative to the center of the origin. Um, but that's let's assume that's plus z naught and minus z naught. So in as in terms of the timing diagram, you have the RF pulse. <coughs> let's skip them. And if you don't have any gradient, then you just have this decay, assuming there is no T2 decay. So if you had the T2 decay, then this would just be decaying like that. Right? Now when the once you switch on the gradient, then you have this spin processing at a different rate compared to this. So relative to the center, center frequency, one would appear echoing phase in this direction, the other would appear echoing phase in this direction. Now that can be flipped uh, if you, let's say, remove the minus gamma g, that minus sign in front of it. But keeping the minus sign basically, uh, this is the um, um, direction of accrual of phase that you would end up with if you mathematically calculate carefully. And um, this precession, uh, what you what you are going to see in the lab frame is the summation of those two frequencies which is what we saw there and that's the uh, precession that you would, uh, that's the signal that you would get. So mathematically speaking, uh, you can write that, write the precession of those two spins at the two different locations z0 and minus z0 as the exponential sum. In this case, there is no integral. It's just a discrete summation because you have two different, two distinct spins. Right? Uh, I'm sorry, if you guys sit here, it's easy for me to 
go uh, anyway that's okay uh, that's fine i'll try to uh, move around um, so you it's basically summation of those two exponentials uh, complex exponentials and by using the trigonometry euler uh, expansion uh, you will see that that becomes 2s not cos and that's the signal that you would um, obtain as a function of time and if you write it in terms of k variable this is what you end up with where k and z0 are related now and to get back the signal uh, meaning to get back the uh, spin density of the protons at, the, at those particular locations you would do the inverse Fourier transformation and which involves these integrals and uh, normally I would have stopped here if I had uh, not brushed up my integral math. So uh, there's no worry, you would have to go back and brush up your integral math, but uh, essentially that turns out to be the in, um, integral of a uh, direct delta function. And that integral essentially leads to uh, a simple delta function, which is basically a peak at that particular spatial location. The delta function, uh, can be understood. Uh, I, I'm sure you, most of you are from engineering background, I assume, right? So you must have uh, encountered the delta function at some point in your digital signal processing courses. <coughs> digital, pro uh, yeah. So you must have encountered at some point. Am I right? Okay. So essentially, that the delta function um, mathematically you can um, define in this manner where when z becomes equal to a is when it has a finite value of 1 and wherever it's not basically the value uh, goes to 0. It can be understood in terms of this integral relationship uh, where uh, it's basically the integral of that um, the, the area under that sink basically. So uh, as k goes to larger and larger values uh, this particular uh, peak goes to infinity, but the area under that sink is constant, which is equal to 1. Now, in terms of the properties of that uh, delta function, uh, because it has a value of 1 only when the uh, function's uh, variable becomes 0, <coughs> you can use that to sample your, um, find the value of a function at a particular point along the axis. So, uh, essentially, this is what um, Meaning, if you do this, if you carry out this integral, you will get the value of f, the function f, at that particular point a. So, um, you will see that the delta function will appear when you are considering the sampling of your continuous signal. Um, so, a series of delta functions, uh, which is typically called the comb function, because it looks like a comb, uh, helps you sample the function uh, along the time axis. So, it suffice to say that you will encounter this when you um, uh, go to the sampling part in, um, uh, and the properties of this particular um, delta function would also become important when you are considering finite sampling uh, and your sampling rate. The other uh, important aspect uh, you would frequently encounter in, in this uh, uh, in general, in MR is the um, the Fourier pair, the rect function, and the corresponding Fourier transform, effect, which is the uh, sink function. So I've just included this uh, as a visual aid. That's it. And I think there's one problem you have to work it out in the um, in the textbook. Um, but uh, the important aspect uh, that you may want to remember with the sink function is that. In reality, when you actually do the Fourier transformation of a, such a sharp transition rect function, your sink function actually goes from minus infinity to infinity, the omega, the frequency content of your sink function, meaning that it's not band limited. Meaning that band limited meaning that the frequency content of your sink function is not finite. So this axis goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So you might want to remember that aspect. Uh, and that would become actually important when you are thinking again of uh, finite sampling aspects. Okay, let's come back to the um, the timing diagram that we started with. So now we 
um, looked at the signal equation and then said, okay, that's the summation of the phase components that the spins are accruing as uh, during this time t1 and t2. And we said the k space domain is useful to understand things. Okay, so let's look at what happens in the k space domain um, when this for this particular uh, pulse diagram. So uh, as we saw earlier, we defined k as the um, as gamma gt, and in the integral form, it would take the uh, form in this manner in the red box. Basically, it's the and gamma bar is, is gamma by 2 pi, so um, just so you remember that. And your phase now becomes 2 pi times z, uh, sorry, k times z. <coughs> k being a function of time, again, um, the t variable is just to signify that you are switching on and off the gradients. If, if g is 0, let's say, k is 0, right? So that means basically because you are switching on and off gradients, k becomes a function of time. So that's why you have the in brackets sign. Okay, so um, well, uh, just one more thing. It's the integral of that parameter. So um, okay, we'll, we'll um, let's continue. So the, the phase parameter is given by this. As I said, um, phase is measured measured in radians. So if you look at the units of k and z, they are they have the inverse relationship. That's why it's easier to relate things. Um, anyway, we'll look at that in chapter 10. Now, uh, so in written in terms of, again, I, I guess we are repeating this equation many times just so it sinks in your mind. And because this is something you're going to write, keep writing throughout the course. So this is laying the foundation in your mind uh, of these expressions. Uh, uh, yeah, so. Uh, again, so again, the key point in this slide, as I mentioned at the bottom, is k takes both negative and positive values for uh, getting back the um, uh, spin density uh, or recovering back the spin density from your sampled signal. You need k values of both positive and negative. So, in this uh, gradient structure that you had, you, um, your k variable. Let's look at the, what what's happening to the k variable between the time t1 and t2. So you have the negative gradient switched on. So your your k value as time progresses is going from zero at t1 to some finite value. So in terms of the k axis, you are going from zero coordinate to some value uh, t2. Let's assume that's k max. So in terms of k k uh, space. This is the mapping. Now, if you have a different, uh, a slightly modified structure of gradients, so earlier you just had t1 to t2, the gradient switched on. Now, let's say you switch on another gradient um, at t3 and then keep going till t4. So, what is happening to your k variable? So, your k variable is now with a gradient, positive gradient g, so it's accruing positive. Uh, k values, meaning that it's traversing in the positive k direction. So in the k space um, mapping, you're basically traversing the end that you ended up with at t2 and then keep progressing towards k max in the positive direction. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Is that So in the previous case, you had the negative gradient on and your k variable in terms of the mapping of that in the, on the k axis is going from 0 at t equal to 1, uh, sorry t1 to t2 and let's assume that t2 is your k max just for the meantime. Now if you have a modified gradient structure where you have the positive gradient switched on subsequent to the negative gradient, what you have is your k variable now from t2 onwards in this case let's uh, between t2 and t3, obviously, the gradient is not switched on, so there is nothing going on with the k axis, right? k is 0. So, from t3 onwards, your k value is actually moving towards your positive axis. So, in terms of k mapping, at t2, you ended up at the one end of the k, k axis, and from t3 onwards, you are moving in the positive direction, right? So, is that clear to everybody? Now, the key point 
uh, to observe now is that at some point it is going to cross the zero point, right? K being equal to zero. So if you go back to that equation of your integral e power i k being zero because i two pi k z, right? So if your phase is zero, that means you don't you don't have any phase. That means you have you are having an echo, right? So that's your that's your echo. That's your t. That's where you will have the peak amplitude of your signal, and that essentially is your gradient echo. <coughs> now this you are understanding that in terms of k axis, how the uh, and, and you will have an intuitive understanding by just looking at the cartoon here. So basically, when you have a positive one sign of gradient, it doesn't have to be positive or negative. One sign of gradient switched on. The dephasing happens in a particular manner, in a particular direction. So as soon as you switch off and switch the polarity of that sign, uh, gradient, now those spins which have dephased due to the presence of gradient are coming back because you 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 you've um, reversed the polarity, meaning that the spins which were processing slower are now processing faster, and vice versa. Now all those words is worth that cardinal, of course. So again, you can um, there. There's quite a bit of online help for you to actually look at the cartoons, but definitely the insight would come only if you sit down and write the equations. What's happening, and we'll see what is happening in terms of the equations. So the cartoon basically is showing that okay, you tip the spins, you have the spread of uh, the spins due to gradient, and then it, when you switch off, switch the polarity. Right there, you have the echo. Okay, that's your gradient echo. So, in terms of the equations, so let's look at what's happening to the phase of the uh, spins as a function of these gradients. So, essentially, the parameter that we're interested in is that pi g z t. In this case, again, we are just looking at one dimension. So, between the time t1 and t2, the phase accrued by the spins due to the presence of the gradient is a function of the position of the spins as you can see it's gamma g z t1 t minus t1 so gamma g z has the units of omega times t which is your phase so the spatial dependency how the phase varies as a function of space is also shown there um, anyway so that's your phase as you move from t1 to t2 and if you substitute t equal to t2 then it's basically t2 minus t1 is your phase at the end of that negative gradient lobe so basically we refer to these as gradient lobes and this is your negative gradient lobe this is positive gradient lobe um, in terms of the terminology so now you, if you look at the phase uh, Greater than in time window somewhere greater than t3, you will see the phase being following this expression where you have the phase that is accrued during the negative gradient flow. Then you have you are writing the same expression here except for your time being basically t minus t3. So that negative gamma g z that expression is not changing, and you are just adding the phi naught that you had due to this negative flow. So, at a, at a particular time t, this particular phase comes to zero, which is the time t equal to t3 plus t3 plus t2 minus t1. So, this duration here, that's when you have the echo. So, um, so the condition mathematically can be written for you to have a gradient echo is that the first moment of your gradient has to be equal to zero. So here, we haven't, because gradient was constant during this time, you just wrote this as a product g times t. In the case where g becomes a function of time, when it switches on, let's say it's a sinusoidal gradient. Okay, it's varying as a function of time sinusoidally. Then this will become an integral of gamma g times um, g dt basically. So it's the first moment. That's this. Gt times t, uh, dt. So the 
first moment of the gradient should be zero for you to have a gradient echo. You can state that in, a, in, a, in other words, for linear, I mean for uh, constant gradients, this area of the slope has to be equal to the area of the slope. The area of the dephasing gradient lobe has to be equal to the area of the dephasing gradient lobe. That's when you will have a gradient echo for a constant gradient. Okay, is that clear to everybody? So um, to again come back to the case space axis, um, if you do a, a coordinate shift uh, or variable shift um, in this case, again, um, I want to say don't ask me why we are doing time shift, but I, I won't say that. What I mean is, um, mathematically, whenever you do a variable substitution, the whole purpose of it is to make your life easy when you are trying to solve a problem, right? Or when you are trying to figure out what is happening with that equation. So that is essentially what you are doing, whether you are doing a time shift or um, k-space variable substitution. But k-space has more um, to it than making your life easy. Uh, just mathematically. It, it also gives you some physical intuition in terms of uh, your experimental parameters. Like I said, you will see that in chapter 10 and further as well. So uh, it is easy to actually realize a few things when you do a time shift uh, and shift your time coordinate to the center of the echo. So when you do that, so t prime becomes your center, uh, your new coordinate. So now anything on this side is negative time and then if you on this side is positive time so your phase is become given by minus lama g z t prime so in terms of your um, paid k space axis essentially t equal to t prime equal to 0 is your center and any negative time is your negative k space and then positive time is your positive k space so essentially during this particular window of time you are going from negative k max to positive k max, meaning that uh, in terms of mapping the Fourier variables z to k, so you are covering the full k space when you are, uh, well you are covering the k space from uh, symmetrically from one end to the other, I would say full k space, but you are covering the k space symmetrically from one end to the other end um, and it has its own advantages. Uh, now let's uh, uh, stop and think for a, for a minute. Um, why do you need both k uh, negative and positive axes? So can you not just do a Fourier transformation of the FID just from here to here and still get an image? Can anybody answer that? So that means essentially in your um, integral, you're just doing from zero to a certain value of k, sorry in this case it is the other one, um, do we have that accessible somewhere, ok I do not want to go, but I mean you know what I am talking about, so if you write s of, uh, sorry uh, rho of z, then this becomes, the integral becomes in terms of um, k and this becomes positive gamma g z t prime or positive i 2 pi k z and the integral is, is over uh, integral variable is k. Is everybody following me or am I? Okay. So the point that I am asking is, can you still recover the signal if you just integrate from 0 to k on one side? From Fourier theory, it is just simple. Basically, if you just have half the spectrum of your of your signal, of your time signal from just 0 to 1 side of your spectrum, can you still reconstruct your signal? Let us say one dimensional time signal. Under what conditions can you fully recover that signal and reconstruct that reliably? So, you, when you have only one side of the spectrum, if your function, if your the actual physical function is real, meaning the Fourier transformation would be symmetric around the center axis, then you can actually just do a mirror image and then you can recover your signal reliably uh, without any error. 
but then if your signal is actually a complex signal, not a real signal, meaning just uh, in terms of the Euler components, it doesn't have just the cos component, but it also has a sine component, meaning it has phase as well in your real signal, then that symmetry uh, is violated and you won't be able to reconstruct the signal just with half the case space or half the spectrum. So you will still have to recover, the, uh, uh, obtain the full spectrum and reconstruct the signal. If you, I mean, you can still try to reconstruct the uh, non, I mean, the complex signal using half the spectrum, but there are, there are methods to do that under certain conditions, uh, if under certain conditions apply. As you will see in practical uh, world, you will have something called partial Fourier. Now, partial Fourier doesn't mean you're just correcting exactly half the case space and then reconstructing the signal from half the data. It has certain other conditions that need to be satisfied for you to be able to do that reconstruction with just part of the data. So that is why sampling signal on both sides of K, both axes of the K, negative and positive, is important for you to rec reliably reconstruct the signal. Okay, so we looked at uh, gradient echo. Uh, that was important uh, for doing your spatial encoding. And the last class you looked at uh, spin echo, where um, to get an echo, you didn't have the gradient, you just had the alpha pulse, and then you, got, you obtained an echo. So what is the difference between gradient echo and the spin echo so far, your understanding? Okay, that's one difference. Any other difference in spin echo is the same magnitude? What same magnitude? Uh, to, to switch it would have uh, the same magnitude. Right, so basically you don't have gradient switched on. Fine, okay. But what is the key difference there? What is what is the purpose of the gradients that you had to use in gradient echo versus what's happening in spin echo? Okay, well the answer that I was trying to it's get at. The right, so gradients are used for spatial encoding. So to get a gradient echo, you are, you, it means that you are trying to do spatial encoding. Whereas for spin echo, you can get the spin echo even without any gradients you, by just using the RF pulse which means that the spin echo doesn't have to do spatial encoding. If you have a gradient switched on while you are getting the spin echo, which is the case shown here, you are using the spin echo to uh, just fortuitously to increase your signal, um, get a higher signal basically. Spin echo obviously gives you, and we'll see that it gives you higher signal than gradient echo because that is decaying at T2 rate and your Without the spin echo, your, your signal is decaying at T2 star rate. Uh, okay, but that point aside, uh, if you even if you didn't have that pi pulse, uh, well, I guess this is not a good example, but um, if you had this gradient structure, you will still have the gradient echo and you can do the spatial encoding. The above structure is just um, helping you to obtain a spin echo where the spin echo is coinciding with your gradient echo. So this pulse structure where you have the um, spin echo <coughs> structure pi by 2 and then pi, if you write the equations like you did last time, um, breaking up the time duration and then writing what is happening to the magnetization transfers and longitudinal, uh, well in this case you can write that for fun and then realize that longitudinal is not playing much role, in this case it's just the transfers that's important. Um, you will see that the phase accrued by the read gradient uh, uh, because of the switching on of the read gradient T1 and T2, uh, just like any presence of background read gradient, is instantaneously the sign of it is switched off, switched opposite at the pulse. And then um, this particular gradient is basically uh, bringing back the case space. Um, you will see the case space figure for this. Um, I think. Uh, we'll look at the uh, equations for this particular star pulse structure, but to get a um, 1D imaging experiment done using a spin echo, this is one way of acquiring the data. Essentially using the fact that 
the Y pulse is instantaneously switching the sign of the phase. So essentially, um, because of the pi pulse, this is effectively a negative polarity gradient. Everybody with me on that? So if you, um, okay, we'll see when we uh, work out the equations. The other variant, of course, is you don't have to apply that uh, dephasing gradient on the other side. Okay, by the way, uh, these, the terminology again, the, I, I mentioned the gradient lobes. This is called the, uh, of course, this is the negative gradient lobe and then positive gradient lobe. But typically, the one, the, the gradient lobe that is preceding the actual acquisition of the signal or the gradient structure which is corresponding to the acquisition of the signal is called the dephasing gradient lobe and this is the rephasing gradient lobe. Is that clear to everybody? That's basically, I mean, literally dephasing the spins, and then this is rephasing the spins by switching the polarity of the um, gradient. So you have two options to obtain uh, to do one D imaging experiment using a spin echo coincided with the gradient echo, meaning that the gradient echo timing uh, is exactly in sync with the uh, center of the spin echo. So, in terms of the case space, uh, as I was mentioning, the effect of the pi pulse is essentially switching the uh, sign of the uh, phase, right? So, with the positive gradient flow in the case space mapping or case space axis, you're going from 0 to positive k because you have a positive gradient flow. And because the switching of the phase, essentially, you have a you are almost moving back to the negative axis because your phase has, the sign of the phase has switched. And then because of the uh, rephasing gradient, we are basically moving from one end to the other end again. In this, in this, in the latter case, you don't have that, um, uh, basically you're just, uh, this is similar to your gradient echo. Basically, you're, without this, this is just your gradient echo. You just have this to have your spin echo coincide with your gradient echo. Um, so in terms of the equations, let's look at what's happening in this case because this is the interesting case. The previous one is just uh, writing the equations of spin echo separately and then gradient echo separately and then you're just making the time, timings of those in sync and then you get the expressions of the uh, signal. In this case, you have to write, okay, what's happening for the phase, to the phase between these two times. Um, let's assume you do have some background field homogeneity, so that's your delta BZ. And then you have the spatially dependent phase because of the gradient that you have uh, uh, switched on. Uh, so that's your phase term, accrual term from time here to here. In fact, um, for the um, gamma delta BZ P, uh, that term the phase is being accrued throughout the duration. If you, you need to make that distinction when you're looking at that expression or writing that expression, the G term is only um, present when you're talking about this window. But then the delta B term is, is present throughout until the time tau. Then you have the reversal of your phase. So until time tau, your phase has accrued because of the delta B, whereas because, because the gradient is only switched on between these two time points, your phase due to the gradient is this, and then you write uh, the subsequent phase term following the pi pulse, which is basically, so this is the negative of this, and then this is the normal same phase term of minus gamma uh, delta B T, where delta B is basically your inherent inhomogeneity and your gradient. So you can uh, work it out, make it equal to zero, and so to figure out what, what time does this um, become, uh, uh, phase become equal to zero, giving you a spin echo and a gradient echo. So that's the condition. If you satisfy that, those conditions, then essentially you will get a gradient echo and a spin echo coincided. So um, we, I, we mentioned earlier uh, that uh, 
the gradient echo amplitude is obviously lower than spin echo amplitude because of the t to star decay. This um, decay curve illustration shows that clearly. So if you want to uh, follow through what's happening as a function of time, so the green curve is the decay curve when you switch on the gradient. If you don't have any gradient on and you just apply the anti degree pulse and you're looking observing the signal on low, you have the P2 star decay, which is your red curve. The green curve is when you switch on the gradient, you have even faster decay because of the presence of the gradient. So you have that. And when you so reverse the gradient, you're you're looking up for a gradient echo, you're setting up for a degradient echo, and that uh, leads to that echo, which is the gradient echo at this at this point. You just coincide with your to start signal. Now, if your gradient echo coincides with your spin echo, then essentially you have this this green curve just shift that here coincides with the uh, spin echo, and that's when you have um, a spin echo imaging experiment versus a gradient echo imaging experiment. So as you can see. Um, if there are advantages for doing gradient echo because, well, in this case, it turns out that these two are, I guess this is not a, a good way of showing it, but if it turns out more or less they are the same amplitude, but you can imagine that your, your spin echo can be here, right? So obviously, the gradient echo at a shorter TE still has a lower magnitude compared to a spin echo applied at a slightly longer TE. You follow me? Everybody. So that's the advantage of having this spin echo. Now the flip side of it is that you have to wait long because you have to apply the pi by 2 and the pi pulse with a finite duration to get your spin echo. Whereas gradient echo is uh, just switching on and off the gradients, which is easier um, and less time consuming. So and 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 spin echoes also have some problems in terms of having the perfect perfectly pi pulse. Um, if in, in case your pi pulse is not exactly reversing the phase, then what are the effects? Um, in, the, in that situation, what's happening? Uh, it won't give you perfectly uh, a spin echo. So all those effects you won't have if you're just having gradient echo. And certainly you can do faster imaging because um, your TEs can be very short and are not limited by the time duration between the pi way 2 and pi pulse. The other aspect is the RF energy because you're not using uh, large amplitude V1 uh, pulses. Um, you're not subjecting the sample or the patient to high intensity radio frequency energy uh, to relate to our physical experiences. Uh, your cell phones are at gigahertz frequency, and if you talk with someone for a couple of hours, you can feel well, one is the battery getting heated up. The other is also um, you will feel uh, the um, your brain does get heated up because of the exposure to the gigahertz frequency electromagnetic radiation, and of course there is some scare about tumors and all that. But uh, the basis for that scare is that when you have radio when you expose the sample to radio frequency energy, you have some energy absorbed by the body which leads to heating up of the tissue, which is not normal. So if you have your tissue heated up, then there are going to be some consequences. So um, long story short, if you have many RF pulses, your sample can get heated up, you will have RF energy deposition and you are avoiding that by not using spin echo. So to conclude, essentially this image uh, gives you a clear impression. Gradient echo image looks a little bit dull compared to spin echo. Uh, of course, the, the, the contrasts are quite, uh, uh, it's not a one one on one fair comparison, but uh, just compare the signal amplitudes in visually, you can see that the spin echo is much starker compared to the gradient echo. Um, you just, uh, you even without that qualitative explanation, you can look at the eyes, you can see clearly the signal inside the vitreous humor. Whereas in the gradient echo, you you're lost. I mean, that signal is lost. Basically, that's because of your uh, low signal amplitude that you have in gradient echoes. Okay, I think that concludes the class today. Uh, could you okay. say it again? Uh, 
what would happen when we have the SPM go and drag in the go on the side? Well, nothing special is happening. You're just having a large amplitude echo. So yeah, basically, the signal adds to the and the signal from the SPM echo adds to the drag in echo. Right. Basically, if you shift this green peak. To here, so that the peak is pointed in here. You get the picture? No. Okay. So this, this is your normal decay. Okay. okay. You apply the gradient. Your signal is peaking faster because of the influence of the gradient, and then you switch off, switch the polarity of the gradient. You have the refocusing. Okay. You have the echo here. All you're doing is shifting that gradient structure to here. Okay, but um, still we have, we get the signal from the gradient echo. Not yeah, okay. yeah. So gradient, like I said, gradient echo is to do your spatial encoding. That's all. But of course, it's it's allowing you to do imaging. I mean, uh, uh, without the necessity of spin echo. So echo is basically getting your phase of the spin zero. It doesn't matter how you're doing it. Now the fact that you're doing that by uh, uh, in the gradient echo by simultaneously also encoding the space, whereas that is not happening in spin echo, so that's the difference. But echo for the echo to happen, your phase is zero for your spins at the echo time. Uh, if we have both, uh, might not have listened to it. Uh, is the DP faster if we have both gradient and spin echo? Well, no. Basically, t two star is uh, already one by t two star is equal to one by t two plus one by t two prime, right? So t two star already has the spin echo. I mean, sorry, t two in it, t two decay in it. Okay. So uh, it's not going to be any faster. So this this recovery is actually one by t two minus one by t two prime, right? Right. When you have a gradient echo, that recovery. Is going to be uh, slightly different from the recovery of your 1 by t2 minus 1 by t2 prime. Okay. That's because of the integral of your uh, phases due to your gradient. But individually, each spin is actually, um, and so you can think of this in this manner. So if you perform this gradient echo experiment by shifting that structure and coinciding with the spin echo, the gradient echo is performing the fu uh, function of encoding the space. You're still getting the spin echo at the center, and by doing uh, that experiment with the uh, repeated times, you're still sampling this curve, and you can quantify your t2. The gradient echo is only helping you to do spatially uh, distinguish the signal from one position in your sample to the other position in the sample. That's all. Is that clear to you? Any other question? So in terms of vendor definitions of the sequences, um, would that be considered a spin echo or a that would be a spin echo sequence even if it uses the gradient echo Yes, really? yes. So okay. if you have a spin echo happening in the in the um, in the acquisition, then it's typically called spin echo. Uh, gradient echoes are also called uh, field echoes because you're just getting the echo by shifting the polarity or switching the polarity of the field. A gradient field, so that so they are also called field echoes. So in Philips, I think there is some term called field echo, and then yeah. um, in um, G, I think it calls it as gradient echo. Um, yeah, or gradient recall is another term that that's used. So um, yeah, I think that's all I can remember right now. So majority of the time we use with uh, gradients, right? Because right, because you want to do spatial encoding. Without uh, that, you're not doing spatial encoding. Now in uh, spectroscopy, which we haven't actually discussed, but in that case where you are not using gradients, but you want to distinguish uh, chemical species processing at different frequencies, there you're not using gradients. So. Uh, I mean, we're going to talk about this in detail, but just imagine this experiment where um, you, well, in that case, you don't have an echo, you're just, um, let me think about it for a second. 
Okay. So let's say you are having this uh, pulse structure where it's the spinnaco pulse structure, right? So you have the pi pi two, and then you have the pi pulse, and you are getting this particular echo sample uh, echo um, in your coil. And let's say you sample it. Now in this case, the fact that this is happening means that you have certain background field homogeneity, right? Now uh, Background field homogeneity is a very generic term, and let's get into the detail of that. Uh, let's uh, meaning so okay. In other words, in by saying background field homogeneity, what are we meaning? Uh, we are saying that the precession frequency of the spins is spatially varying due to some change in the background field that the protons are experiencing. That may be a deterministic or a, a, a non-deterministic random feature. Okay. One of the cases where it, it is deterministic is the chemical shift where um, the hydrogen protons, let's say, in water, have slightly different precession frequency compared to hydrogen protons in, in say, lipids, fat. So because of that, and it's fixed, it's finite. It's not a random shift. It has a finite characteristic to it, finite difference. So because of that. Um, you can, because of that, also you can see this kind of behavior. So let's assume that there is no other background field homogeneity, and you just have those chemical species dependent um, precession frequency shifts, and you have this kind of uh, echo happening. So you sample this echo, and there, even though you didn't use the um, gradient strand chord space, uh, well, here you're not trying to visualize where these chemical species are. If you take that particular spectrum and then do a Fourier transformation, remember even this is basically the integral of e power i phi, where phi is your phi is your gamma delta b, meaning phi is dependent on your field homogeneity. In this case, that field homogeneity term is chemical shift between one species to the other. So again, you will end up with a term with, a, with an equation which is a Fourier relationship between the precession um, Frequency uh, content of the signal, and um, yeah, in this case, it's just uh, there's no k space here because you're not encoding space. It's just uh, e power i omega times t omega being a spread of frequencies. That's your integral, and your s of t is your sample as a function of time. So you just it's time versus omega. And you take the Fourier transformation of it, you get the frequency spectrum, where uh, the peaks at a given omega mean that the chemical species, uh, the amplitude of the peak at a given particular omega, is corresponding to the uh, amount of the chemical that is present at that particular resonance frequency. If this is just a very hand-waving explanation. You will see the formal equations eventually, but. Um, you can use uh, the spin echo for doing that without any gradients. That's one one example where you're doing that without using gradients. There you're not encoding space, but you're encoding the, the chemical species. 